Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Gann of Stellaris Management Services, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar, Understanding Romania's Credit and Collection Environment. We have quite a large crowd in attendance today from around the globe, and I thank you all for being here. Today's webinar, the first of many under the Burens Education Series, is sponsored by Burens European Collection Attorneys. Burens, established in 1952, is the oldest and largest commercial collection law firm in Europe. With a team of over 100 attorneys and staff, Barron's provides a one-stop shop model for your complete B2B debt recovery process throughout all of Europe. Before starting our webinar, let me take a moment to bring your attention to one item on the control panel on your screen. When you logged in and connected, a little control panel should have popped up on the right side of your computer screen. Towards the bottom of the control panel is where you can send in a question. As we'll be having the Q&A session after the presentation, please feel free to send in your questions along the way, and as best as possible, we'll try to get to all of them. Regarding today's presentation materials, please contact us afterwards, and we'll be happy to email them out to you. Now, let me take a moment to briefly introduce today's presenter, Mr. Alexandru Buzamet. Mr. Buzamet received his bachelor's and master's degrees in business law from the University of Bucharest, writing his thesis on insolvency law. Mr. Buzamet has been a registered member of the Bucharest Bar Association since 2011 and also a member of the Amsterdam Bar Association since 2014. Since joining the Barron's international team of lawyers, Mr. Buzamet has been successfully representing clients for collections litigation and consulting throughout Romania. So with that, let's get started. Alex, please take it away. Thank you, Stephen, for the kind introduction. And first of all, let me also greet our viewers for today. During the course of this presentation, uh, which will last more or less uh, one hour, we will cover the following subjects. First, we will take a look at the political and economical climate in Romania. Afterwards, we'll continue with subjects which are most interesting for professionals involved in credit management and debt recovery activities, such as having an overview of the legal and judicial system of Romania, uh, taking a look at the legal proceedings, including insolvency and enforcement, also calculation of interest and costs, and last but not least, at the end of the presentation, we will give you some tips of doing business in Romania. Let's start by taking a quick look at some facts about Romania. Uh, Romania is a member of the NATO organization since 2004. Also since 2007, Romania became part of the EU, becoming the 27th member state from a total of uh, 28 current members. Our state is organized as a semi-presidential democracy with a bicameral parliament. The capital of, Bucharest is, uh, of Romania is in Bucharest. Romania has almost 20 million citizens. Our GDP is of uh, 180 billion US dollars. And our local currency is the LEU. Uh, the exchange rate of uh, one US dollar to Romanian currency is 4.1. Now, uh, regarding our political climate uh, in Romania, we recently had general elections. And following these elections, the left-wing party, the Social Democratic Party, won 46% of the seats in the parliament. Together with the Association of Liberals and Democrats, they formed a strong majority in the parliament. Our new government is led by Mr. Sorin Grindanu, a member of the Social Democratic Party. The government has as a main task to implement social measures, including cutting down taxes, the increase of the minimum wage, and general increases in social benefits. With a strong coalition in force, the implementation of these measures will not be a problem at all. However, because the president is still in favor of the opposition parties, frictions are expected to occur. I can give as an example uh, um, several things, uh, but we'll mention only the recent laws which were sent back to the constitutional court by the president and also the refusal of appointment of the first proposed government. New pre um, now, even though the business world did not perceive these recent developments as negative, concerns are expressed in relation to the possible future of changes in relation to taxes. 
Of course, uh, you can imagine that cutting down taxes uh, for the population and increases in minimum salaries will have to be financed somehow. Now, uh, switching from politics to economics, we see on this slide the ratings that Romania has received from the top three rating agencies. Just by looking at the rating of uh, Moody's, uh, which is uh, BAA3, you can notice that Romania has a positive trend. Romania's rating has been improved uh, mainly because of the government's policy to cut down public expenses since 2009 and the continuous policy of the government to improve the economic climate for small and medium enterprises. Here are some uh, main figures of Romania's economy. Looking at the GDP growth, we can uh, conclude that the economy of Romania is quite stable, thus making it more appealing for investors. Also, you can see the forecast for unemployment indicates a continuous decrease in, uh, until 2018. Now, moving to our next area of interest, we will take a look at the legal and judicial system of Romania. On this slide, our, we can see our judicial system, how it's organized. It consists of courts of law on one side, the public ministry, which is actually the prosecution's office, and the Supreme Council of Magistracy, which is overlooking over the previous two uh, systems. Courts are organized based on the administrative division of, of Romania. Respectively, we have two, 42 counties. Therefore, we have on top the High Court, which has a general competence throughout Romania. We have 15 uh, courts of appeal, which render services for one or more counties. Then tribunals are established one per county, so 42 in total. And you have 188 first instance courts that are scattered throughout Romania. We have seen the judicial system and now we will have to take a look at the legal system. Romania's legal system is based on civil law. Uh, that means that our rules of law are codified and other specific regulations are found in separate legislative documents. Also, court judgments have no legislative effect, of course, with effect of, uh, with exception of uh, some uh, uh, court decisions, for example, the decisions of the Constitutional Court. You can see on this slide the key components that uh, form our legal framework for debt recovery and credit management. The first two items that you see, which are the new civil procedure code and the new civil code, have been recently introduced, respectively in uh, 2009 and 2010, and replaced the old codes from 1864, which were, of course, uh, amended during the, 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 the past years, but still these new codes give a fresh breath of air to um, creditors' rights. The other two legislative documents, which are Law 72 per 2013 and Ordinance 13 per 2011, regulate specific subjects such as interest and costs and other debt recovery matters. Now, i like to show you uh, the number of court dockets per year, pending or new. Uh, as a general observation, you can notice that the number of pending cases at the end of the year has gone up, but that the total number of cases per year went down. I have to say, as a lawyer from Romania, that uh, in general, Romanians are litigants, so prepare yourself. Interest and collection costs. Um, we will discuss now on this subject, which is, I would say, one of the most uh, frequently brought subject, subjects by, by our clients. Uh, knowing what are you entitled to ask for is very important, uh, not only because you need to show your debtors that you know the rules of the game, but also to avoid losing the chance of collecting uh, the, uh, uh, recovering the collection costs. So, uh, taking a look at the, at the slide, you can see interest is calculated from uh, either from one of these three moments. First of all, if you set a due date, then starting from that due date, without having to give any notice, interest will be calculated. In case no due date was agreed, then you have um, the interest will start to occur from 
on 30 days from the date when the debtor has received the invoice under the condition that the services were already rendered or the merchandise was already delivered. Now, in case the merchandise was delivered at a later date or the service was rendered at a later date than the date when the invoice was received, then starting from the later date, uh, 30 days will be calculated. Also, as a general rule, payment periods may not exceed 60 days. Uh, and in case parties agree to a longer uh, uh, payment term than this, the clause which sets the longer payment uh, uh, term is already presumed to be abusive. And if the creditor complains to court, he might get the uh, clause to be deemed as uh, abusive and uh, null. Now, um, we saw how to uh, calculate uh, the interest, but what percentage do we apply? Well, we have three different scenarios. Now, as legal professionals, we first look at uh, which law is applicable to the contract itself. In case foreign law is applicable uh, to the contract, then the laws of that third party state will determine also the interest level. The second option, if Romanian law is applicable, we can have either one of two situations. First of all, if payment was set in a foreign currency, then you're entitled to receive an interest of 6% flat, which will, will be applied over the what is due. And in case payment was set in Romanian currency, then the interest will be calculated as the interest rate of the National Bank of Romania plus 8, eight percentage points. Now, uh, the last time it was uh, published, the uh, reference rate of National Bank of Romania was 1.75, so you get 9.75%. With regards to costs, um, of course, aside from, uh, from interest, creditors are entitled to receive compensation for uh, costs, in principle for all of them, but uh, you do have to bear in mind that you need to both justify the costs and you also have to be able to uh, prove it, that you affect these costs. We have as a minimum uh, 40 US dollars that uh, you will receive as a compensation, and that is also to be considered only for internal uh, process of uh, recovery of your company. Now, we will see in the upcoming four slides the legal remedies that uh, a creator has at hand when the adapter doesn't comply with your demand. Well, firstly, we will see on this slide just three main rules that apply to legal proceedings in Romania. Um, the, civil, the Romanian Civil Procedure Code has more than 1,100 uh, articles, so bear in mind, please, that this is a very brief presentation. So, first, legal action is brought before courts in a place where the defendant has his headquarters or domicile. There are some exceptions, but this is the, the main rule. Second, depending on the value of the claim, above or under 55,000 US dollars, either the first court of justice or the tribunal will be first competent to give a ruling on the case. And third, the civil cases, they can have up to three different procedural stages. So you have the, the judgment which is given at the first court, and then you can make an appeal and the second appeal. If your claim is uh, lower than 117, thousand US dollars, then you will not have the right to make a second appeal. Now, uh, there are, of course, other uh, special appeals, but those are only for a uh, very um, small number of cases. Now, uh, before we continue, I must explain that uh, there are two main types of procedures, respectively regular and alternative. Uh, there are several differences between these two types of proceedings, but most important is that alternative proceedings have special conditions for accessibility. Uh, other differences will be noticed during the presentation, such as the costs or the efficiency of the proceedings. Now, first looking at the regular proceedings, uh, these have no special conditions of accessibility, require no pre-litigation proceedings, so you don't have to give any kind of notice, and can take from three months to one year. 
Uh, a small inconvenience is brought by the fact that you need to make uh, a choice of domicile in Romania, but that can be very easily overpassed uh, with the help of a lawyer from Romania because you can set up this uh, legal domicile at the office of the lawyer. Now, we move to the first uh, alternative, uh, first type of alternative proceedings, the payment ordinance procedure, which um, is a procedure that, first of all, uh, costs in terms of stamp duty only 50 US dollars, so it doesn't matter if you claim a thousand US dollars or a million, the stamp duty will remain the same. Is applicable only in cases where your receivable comes from a signed contract. So if you have anything else in that, you will not be able to access these proceedings. And has, uh, in terms of procedure, two parts, an extrajudicial one and a judicial one. In the first part, you send a written notice with, uh, um, in which you request a payment in 15 days. And that notice will have to be sent through register post or through the services of a bailiff. Now, in case the debtor does not comply, you will initiate the judicial phase sending the request to court where it takes up to 45 days to reach a, uh, a judgment. All in all, in average, it takes up to 90 days to get uh, judgment. Now, in case the court finds the request grounded, um, the past judgment will be immediately enforceable, that is, even if the debtor makes an appeal. As you, will be, uh, as you will see a bit further on, costs are significantly bigger in comparison to uh, uh, the costs of uh, this procedure are very low in comparison to the ones of regular proceedings. We're moving on to the second form of uh, alternative proceedings. Um, I would say that this one is not uh, used in the business world so much, uh, mainly for two reasons. First of all, uh, these proceedings uh, apply only in uh, cases where uh, the receivable is of maximum 2,350 US dollars. Similar to the payment ordinance procedure, uh, it takes up to 90 days to obtain a judgment and the procedure is based on standardized forms. So basically the claimant and the defendant will interact only in a separate, a special form and not freely. In terms of method of proof for these two alternative procedures, uh, with regards to the uh, payment ordinance procedure, you will use uh, only written documents. And with regards to the small claims procedure, you can use also other forms of uh, method of proof but they will have to be reasonable in terms of costs to exercise them. Now, let's take a look at uh, how much it costs in terms of stamp duty uh, to go to court. Uh, as you can see on the top part of the slide, uh, that those are the taxes which are applied for uh, filing a regular uh, claim to a start regular proceedings. And on the lower part, you see the stamp duty payable for uh, alternative procedures. Um, yeah, it is easy to oversee the costs for regular proceedings are way higher than for the alternative ones. It costs 10 to 40 US dollars to make use of alternative proceedings, while with regular proceedings, you will pay a percentage of the value of the claim. Also, in general, um, stamp duty you have to know the stamp duty is owed in advance, and in case you fail to comply, then the claim will be annulled. The debtor will not even receive notice of your claim. The court will just dismiss it. Now, because companies can also go bad, <laughs> we uh, ha cannot avoid the discussion on insolvency. Um, first, uh, you will have to understand that uh, companies that are declared insolvent will go first in a general observation period, following which the company can go either into restructuring proceedings to be put back on track, or it will go into bankruptcy proceedings. With regards to the duration of the proceedings, only restructuring uh, proceedings are limited for a period of three years, and you can uh, ask for an extension of one year more uh, if the request is grounded 
with regards to the conditions, uh, as a creditor, uh, your receivable will have to be uh, in following. It will have to be older than 60 days. It will have to be at the minimum value of 9,350 US dollars. Now you can join uh, uh, action with uh, another creditor to reach its limit. And also your receivable will have to be uh, uncontested, liquid, and due payable. Uh, the first and last one I think I understand with regards to the liquid, I'm going to explain a bit. Liquid means that the, uh, your receivable is a valuable in money. Now, with regards to the documentation, you will need, as with any other claim, the contract, invoices, and proof of delivery. All these documents will have to be deposited together with the claim and they will have to be in uh, Romanian translated via the services of a legal translator. Now, it can be also that you will not be required to have all these documents. Uh, it is the uh, legal duty of the debtor to declare known creditors. And if you are a known creditor, it's the duty of your lawyer to check if whether or not you were declared already, and in that case you will have an easier job to get your claim registered. As with any other proceedings, you have uh, possible difficulties such as lack of proper documentation or opposition from debtor or third parties. Again, your legal assistant will have to give you proper assistance and advise whether or not you're having a solid case. With regards to the costs, please consider that a lawyer will charge approximately 2,000 US dollars in average. Translators will charge 3, 4 US dollars per page, and that is in Romania. Stamp duties of only 40 US dollars, and most important, no, the court may set a bail up to 9,500 US dollars in case the court fears that your claim is abusive. The effects of opening is obviously proceedings are vast, but the main effects are all enforcement proceedings are stopped, so we will not be able to do anything anymore through uh, the belief. All creators must, must join the proceedings, and here I have to give you a warning. The moment you hear of a debtor going bankrupt or you receive such a notice, there is a certain deadline, which is more or less a month, in which you will have to register a receivable. If you fail to do so in the given time, then you will lose the right to recover the claim, even if the debtor goes into restructuring and then comes back healthy. Also, uh, the activity of the debtor will be either run under the supervision and control of the creator or directly by the trustee. On this slide, you can observe the, the number of bankruptcies, uh, bank, uh, number of bankruptcy dockets per year. Of course, following the economical crisis uh, that took place in 2008, a lot of companies were declared bankrupt. Uh, comparing 2012 with 2015, we can see that now we are um, having half of the number of bankruptcies and this only shows that the business environment in Romania went through a process of cleansing up to, uh, and, and now only the healthy companies have remained uh, active. Moving on to enforcement proceedings, we will have uh, uh, three different tabs. Uh, here I will speak a bit in general of uh, enforcement proceedings. First of all, um, all the enforcement proceedings are done by bailiffs, which uh, are uh, appointed by the Ministry of Justice. Their offices are set up independently from the court and uh, they are of course under the supervision of the court, but with them you will have to interact directly. Enforcement proceedings are started, initiated only based on enforcement titles which are listed by law and these are definitive judgments and by that you have to understand judgment, uh, judgments which have passed the first appeal, and also non-definitive judgments which are provisionally enforceable. And uh, for example, the payment ordinance uh, procedure when you receive a judgment, that's appealable, but the reinforcement uh, starts, uh, effect starts immediately. Authentic titles, so documents concluded with the notary's office, 
are also enforceable. Uh, great uh, instruments such as promissory notes and checks. Documents of the enforcement officer, for example, the uh, decision of the enforcement officer where he sets the cost for doing enforcement, and also European enforcement titles. Now we will split uh, the slide on uh, enforcement, enforcing a judgment which comes from uh, another state of the EU and uh, judgments which come from third party, uh, third uh, party states. Uh, because our system makes a, a big difference between them. So EU judgments, uh, if a judgment is given in a member state, it will be enforceable in Romania without any declaration of enforceability being required. We have uh, payment orders, European enforcement orders, when the claim would, was undisputed, uh, which are also directly enforceable. Last but not least, you have to consider Romania is a signatory of the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. So, if you have a judgment following uh, arbitration proceedings, we will recognize it and enforce it in Romania without any problem. Now, moving on to a slide which I think is more interesting for our listeners from the United States. Um, foreign judgments, so judgments coming from the United States will be considered like that, must be recognized prior to enforcement in Romania. This is called an executive procedure. The court proceedings will take place at the tribunal from where the debtor has its headquarters or domicile, and in case we cannot determine it, it will be with the tribunal of Bucharest. The debtor will be summoned, and he will have to appear before the court to give an uh, explanation and try to defend himself. You will need to have the following documents to be able to uh, proceed, and also, therefore, they will have to be apostilled and translated in Romania. So you will have to have a copy of the judgment, proof of the fact that the judgment is final, and also a copy of the proof that the service uh, of the claim was done in a proper manner, so the debtor has received uh, uh, had the debtor's right of defending himself was respected. Now, I mentioned earlier that promissory notes are um, enforcement uh, um, titles, and uh, yeah, so this is very important because um, promissory notes, which in general are known as payment instruments, are also used as a form of security. Um, now, as indicated earlier, promissory notes have the advantage of being enforcement titles, thus granting uh, to its uh, possessor the possibility to initiate proceedings, uh, enforcement proceedings immediately. They can be issued in blank, and uh, with that, you will have only two conditions. First of all, that the promissory note bears the signature of its issuance, and that the intention of issuance in blank was obvious, so either given expressly or tacit. Now, this can either come from the contract, which uh, has as a ground of the receivable which is secured, or it can also be as an uh, indication on the promissory note itself, uh, between brackets, given in black. Very often the promissory note will be also guaranteed by the shareholder of the debtor company, making the shareholder jointly uh, and separately uh, liable for the uh, payment of the debt. Now, as a final note, Please be careful, the promissory note must be deposited with the beneficiary's bank within three years from the date of its issuance. If you fail to meet that deadline, then the promissory note will lose its effect. Uh, now, I've listed on this slide some public sources of information that are 100% reliable, but unfortunately, all three of them are available only in Romanian. However, third-party services, uh, such as uh, the one provided by COFAS, provides information in English language uh, against a, a small fee, and their information is also gathered from these sources. Just uh, for reference, uh, you will have the websites of the National Trade Register, which uh, gives information on companies, Secondly, the Romanian Ministry of Finance, which has balance sheets uh, and also uh, indicates debts towards public institutions. 
And uh, lastly, the Romanian Ministry of Justice has a web page where uh, you can see uh, court dockets. Now, uh, on a different kind of note, I want to give you some information on what is the specific business behavior in Romania. Now, first of all, Romanians are very often considered polite. We very often uh, we're using when we're meeting somebody new the family name, and we're quite strict. No hugging, no uh, no other gestures. We just uh, appreciate a, uh, a firm handshake, and that's it. Um, we are the kind of people that speak more on the phone than we do email correspondence. So in case you want to have a, a first contact, I would recommend you to use the phone first. If you attend the meeting, consider that uh, very often it's, it's formal, it's very formal, and we do not exchange gifts. Gifts are usually exchanged with, uh, with, with friends, people that you know for a longer time. With regards to contracting, you have to uh, be aware that uh, almost all our contracting is done in written form and is very, very formal and strict. We have a general rule of law that anything that goes above uh, 50 US dollars has to be done in written, otherwise it's not valid. And also when it comes to going to court, uh, having a stamp on a piece of paper or having a very clear contract makes a big difference. Now, during the negotiations, uh, I have to admit, uh, even for myself, Romanians are very direct and will always aim to be most effective. So prepare yourself during the meeting for decisive uh, uh, interactions with Romanians. It's also to be noted that um, we are fond of having several stages of negotiations. So if you don't cut a deal during the first meeting, don't be scared. It's normal that you will have to give it a couple of tries until you will reach a final agreement. And uh, that concludes it, and I will give the uh, moderation back to Stephen. Alex, thank you so much. That was a very informative presentation. And we have so many questions that have come in. We'll try to get to all of them. The first one is, at what point does the guarantor on a promissory note become liable for a company debt? In other words, if the debtor company does not go bankrupt, do you need a judgment to go after the guarantor? No, you don't need that. So the moment uh, the uh, main debtor, so the issuance of the promissory note uh, is in default, you can go after uh, both uh, the, the, the issuance and the guarantor for the debt. They're not allowed to ask you to go first for one or the other. Both of them are jointly and severally liable. Great, thank you. Here's the next question. So if I have a valid claim for US $100,000, what would be the tax I would have to pay to file suit? Could you return to that schedule? Of course. So, it will be above 58,500 uh, US dollars. So you will have 1,140 US dollars that you will need to pay plus 1% of that. So you will have again uh, uh, 1,000 euros uh, of what exceeds, no, it's 1% uh, of what exceeds 58,400. Uh, so you will pay actually 1,000 440 US dollars and 1% above uh, 41,600 US dollars. So if I'm looking at that, it looks like uh, $1,440 plus right. the excess uh, between 100,000, between 100,000 and 58,400 is $41,600 and 1% right. of that is $400 and sixteen dollars so it's about uh, one thousand nine hundred dollars exactly okay very good the next question assuming that in most cases overseas companies will have a written agreement you would most usually sue a debtor under the payment ordinance procedure so Again, um, in all our cases, we look uh, where we have a competence, uh, legal competence to go to court. 
Uh, it's very often in all contracts today that we have a uh, choice of uh, law and of uh, uh, competent court. In case that would be Romania, then yes, I would first go through a payment ordinance procedure and the reason is very simple. Uh, if I have a contract, I will always choose to pay a stamp duty of only 40 euros to get a judgment which is immediately enforceable rather to, than to go through regular proceedings which take a lot more time of course more than 90 days and also I have to pay a stamp duty as you've seen which is a percentage of the value of the claim. Thank you. Here's our next question. Are there collection agencies in Romania? Is there a credit and collection association or a formalized industry? So of course we have uh, uh, collection agencies in Romania. Um, I would say that uh, within the last years they made kind of a bad name for themselves uh, because of uh, some practices. There is also an association for debt collection. Uh, it is not mandatory as I know to be part of uh, one of those associations and also their, um, their rules which they issue, they're, uh, they, they're bound only the members of the association, so ones which are voluntarily attending that association. Uh, very good. Here's our next question. Is factoring receivables a common practice in Romania? Yes, I would say it's, uh, it's done by a lot of companies. Okay, thank you. Here's our next question. In the U.S., the Fair Debt Collection Practice, uh, Protection Act, or Practices Act, details what collectors can and cannot do, especially on consumer claims. In reference to your law, 72.213, does this law detail what collectors can and cannot do when it comes to collection activities? No. So, in Romania, there is no law that regulates collection activities. And, uh, yeah, for that, reasons, uh, for that reason, it happens sometimes that uh, these collection agencies make a abusive uh, acts, and uh, that's why I said that uh, there are also some negative... Uh, there's also a negative image attached to some of these companies' uh, activities. Okay, very good. We're going back to the payment procedure. In view of the advantages of the payment ordinance procedure, why would anyone want to use the regular uh, procedure? Well, um, first of all, it's not a matter of, um, not only a matter of will, but also of possibility. So, whenever um, you uh, need more than documents to prove your claim, you will have to go through regular proceedings. And if you try to do uh, the, the, to obtain a judgment through a payment ordinance procedure, the request will be rejected and you will need to follow the regular proceedings. So, I would say, again, it's a chance that you have, but in case it's not accessible, then you will need to go through regular proceedings. Very good. Okay, the next question. I may not have understood the interest cost clearly. Regarding being able to charge interest, even if your original agreement does not include a requirement to pay interest on a pass-through account, can a creditor still charge interest? If so, what is the allowable interest rate? Yes. So, uh, in case a special agreement was not made on interest, default interest will still be applicable. Now, depending on the currency of the payment which was set, so either you have payment in foreign currency, then you have 6%, and in case you have payment in Romanian currency, then you will have the, national, uh, the, the, the reference rate of the National Bank of Romania plus 8%. So, it doesn't matter if you didn't set already that your uh, uh, counterparty will have to pay interest. That's already applied by law. Very good. Our next question. Could you explain again what is an abusive request? How do you define an abusive request? Well, um, let me just go back to the slide where I speak about uh, the abusive request. So, um, strictly uh, referring to uh, these bankruptcy proceedings and the, uh, which case would be considered as an abusive request. 
let's say that um, a creditor will meet the requirements which are indicated here. So it, he will have a, a minimum value of 9,350, receivable is older than 60 days, and his debt has these qualities, but still the debtor is not a company which is insolvent. And by that I mean that the company has sufficient liquidity to cover outstanding debts. Uh, then that claim will be considered as abusive. I'm going to give just as a, a small example. Uh, I don't know if you know the company called Metro Cash and Carry. It's a large uh, uh, agro uh, supplier from Germany. In Romania, it was recently uh, it recently happened that a small, very small provider uh, supplier has asked for the insolvency of this giant uh, agro uh, supplier. So yeah, it happens sometimes, and that's why this uh, this uh, bail can be asked. So. The, debtor, uh, the debtors will be pr uh, protected also. Very good, thank you. The next question is, as our company sells materials that are installed into a structure, is it possible to file a mechanics lien against the property where the equipment that is installed becomes a permanent part of the structure? So, I would say, according to our civil code, no, they are considered as being uh, still accessories. Uh, we have a special provision regarding uh, construction materials. They always become part of the uh, immovable asset. But, for example, if you have uh, solar panels that you will uh, uh, install in a, in a building, they will remain to be considered as accessories and you will have, uh, according to the contract, and specific situation, the right to either ask for the payment or uh, if you have a movable mortgage on the panels themselves, then to enforce on those. But otherwise, no, uh, it's not going to extend to the, to the whole building. Thank you. Very good. Here's our next question. What kinds of items should be put or included on a new customer credit application? For example, are there specific tax and registration numbers that should be required on the credit application, and can these be verified? Well, um, we we do have um, two unique identification numbers which are given to all companies in Romania. So the tax authorities give a, a unique identification number, and also the trade register gives a number. These can be checked, of course, uh, on the uh, Ministry of Finance uh, website and also on the website which I've indicated earlier, which is this one, the National Trade Register. So here is the source of obtaining this information and checking. Great, thank you so much. Uh, is it necessary for the overseas creditor to be a witness at court? No, it's not necessary. Uh, however, uh, if the counterparty makes a grounded request in this sense, the court may deem that uh, the claimant appears before the court. So again, uh, normally you you use methods of proof such as documents, in, especially in commercial uh, claims. But if somehow it is still necessary that the claimant uh, has to appear before the court, then the judge may approve that. Thank you. Here's our next question. How does Barron's handle pre-suit claims? Can you talk about the commission rates? Well, we work based on a no win, no fee uh, system and in case we collect we apply uh, a, a fee based on a graduate scale. In terms of uh, the way we work, uh, we have a, an extrajudicial uh, uh, procedure which takes uh, from two to three weeks during which we lawyers directly take contact with the debtor, we send notices through uh, a registered post, and we put enough pressure that in a lot of cases debtors decide just to negotiate with us rather than to go through the pain and suffering of going to court. And uh, did you want to mention something about the fees or the commission rates? Well, uh, without saying numbers, uh, because I would have to explain a lot, again, we work based on a no-win-no-fee, so if we do not collect anything, we do not charge anything, 
And if we collect something, then we apply a graduated scale. Very good. Do you assist, does Barron's assist in performing on-site meetings to verify the potential customer's office, factory, or operation? Well, lawyers are not allowed to perform uh, these activities, excepting, of course, meetings, which we can assist on. But uh, with regards to the others, we can use third parties' services to assist in a sense. We have the next question. You've mentioned two unique ID numbers, VAT and Trade Register. Which of the two is most frequently used when you want to ask for a credit check? Uh, I would say the VAT number. And why is that? Well, because uh, first of all, it's shorter, so a lot of people like to use that, and also um, a lot of systems that I use, they always uh, check this number. It's also international, uh, VAT can be checked through uh, also the VS system. So, for example, um, um, if you have a, a company based in Romania, uh, a creator from a different state can also check uh, in uh, international uh, organization uh, uh, websites if a uh, VAT number is valid, validly issued by that state, whilst the registration number given by the trade registry is more local. Okay, thank you. Here's our next question. I actually have a claim against a company in Bucharest that seems to have disappeared. Does Behrens provide skip tracing services? Are there skip tracing firms in Romania? Well, uh, we have investigators, but again, this uh, business is not so evolved. Uh, we, Beers, we can assist clients in the process of identifying the companies and the whereabouts of associates uh, or managers of the company. Um, mainly, we do that through uh, checking the, the public registers and, uh, yeah, Going from there on, we will need to uh, use uh, services of uh, the National uh, People's Registry. Okay, very good. Uh, are, the next question, are there, uh, is insuring receivables a common procedure or a common practice in Romania? Well, I would say that it depends on the, um, uh, yeah, the size of the company, with the medium and uh, large companies, it's it's practice. With smaller ones, no, I think not. Okay. Going on to the next question. I may not have understood the interest costs clearly. Regarding being able to charge interest, even if your original agreement does not include a requirement to pay interest on a past due account, can a creditor still charge interest? If so, what is the allowable interest rate? So, as I mentioned, um, even if you don't have in the contract included a special clause regarding uh, uh, interest rate, um, you will still be entitled to collect it uh, based on the, on, on the uh, law provisions of the law. Uh, in case you will uh, have uh, a payment set in uh, foreign currency, you will have 6%. And in case you will have payment set in Romanian currency, then you will have 9.75%. And that is, again, even if you don't mention anything about paying uh, penalty interest for being late with a receivable. Great. Thank you very much. If a company has declared bankruptcy and we take them to court and the court found that the company was not registered with the country, with the authorities, and they left the country. How can we recover the debt? Yeah, well, this is a very complicated situation. If you're saying that the company was not actually registered and you're not speaking about a company, you're speaking only about individuals which acted uh, in, a, a, in a criminal way, and then you need to follow the individuals themselves. That task, again, is uh, something uh, special, and from case to case we can give some advice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The next question. In Brazil, there is a formal arbitration resolution system in our country. Rather than going through the court proceedings, 
If the creditor and debtor voluntarily decide to use an arbitration setting in which the result will be legally binding, is that possible in Romania? Can you explain? Yes. So Romania's Civil Procedure Code regulates arbitration proceedings. Uh, for the, uh, if, if you agree with an arbitral clause, uh, that uh, you will give exclusive competence to uh, an arbitral uh, um, court, then that clause is binding for both parties. That, by that I mean that they will have to, uh, in case of any dispute, to uh, uh, hand over their claim to the uh, um, arbitral court, and the decision of the arbitral court will be enforceable. And as I mentioned also, Romania is part of the New York uh, Convention, so even uh, judgments given by uh, arbitral uh, institutions from uh, foreign countries, they will be recognized in and enforceable in Romania. Very good, thank you. Uh, are there any banking or overseas remittance restrictions within your country? No, payments uh, affected through the uh, banking system, they have to be accompanied by, by proof of their cause. So, uh, in case the debtor wants to make a payment, uh, he just needs to attach a copy of the invoice or of the contract to show the, the purpose of the payment. Very good. Uh, next question, is payment by credit card a common method of payment uh, when doing business-to-business uh, -business transactions? From what I've seen, no. Uh, payments are usually made through bank transfers. Okay, very good. And uh, the next question is, uh, can you go back to the slide on business uh, considerations in Romania, the last slide? Right, yeah. And how, uh, the last uh, uh, statement says, Several stages of negotiation are commonly used in order to reach an agreement. From beginning to end, generally, how long does this process entail? Well, of course, it depends, but normally when you're having a business and you're having also lawyers involved, it's very often that you're going to have a first meeting in which you set the uh, commercial uh, conditions, and then you will have lawyers working behind these contracts for uh, some period of time. And then you will have a second stage of discussions through emails on whether or not you agree to what happened. And you will have a third uh, meeting again if uh, some uh, uh, differences exist. And in the end, the final meeting with the signing of a contract. So it's not that easy that you're going to have just uh, one meeting and during that meeting you're going to agree on all points. As I said, Romanians are direct and they will, be try, they will try to be effective. So also, Having that in mind, with all the formalism that we have in Romania, I would say that there are a lot of points to cover and discuss, so I'm expecting it always to, to, to take a, a couple of meetings to, to reach an agreement. Very good. The next question, maybe a little bit of a difficult one. Uh, uh, in view of the uh, political situation uh, in the Middle East, in Turkey, in Russia, in the Ukraine, uh, has this been affecting the economic, the economy of Romania in any way? Uh, well, I would have to give only my personal opinion on this. I'm not a specialist in uh, in politics, but uh, and from my opinion, no, it hasn't affected. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a very uh, solid uh, uh, business cooperation with Russia. Most of our uh, um, yeah, business activities are done with Western Europe, so yeah, we were not so affected actually. I think, again, my opinion. Okay, thank you. Here's the next question: What is Romania's largest, or which country is Romania's largest trading partner? Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, from Europe, I think uh, we do a lot of business with Germany. Also, Italy. I will have to check, though. I, I would say uh, Germany is uh, always uh, a strong uh, partner. Going on. In the U.S., a countersuit is sometimes used as a strategy to thwart a creditor's suit or force a creditor to accept a much smaller settlement. Is this strategy common in Romania? 
Well, I would say no. Uh, if you if you have, uh, have seen before, uh, any claim, so including the counterclaim, will be subject to payment of a stamp duty. Therefore, it's uh, very re easy to understand why somebody will not make a, a counterclaim just for the sake of it. Okay, I'm going to have to just. Uh, give you one more question. We have several others because we're coming up to the end of the hour and we have to wrap it up shortly. Uh, let's see, where is that question? Is um, how long does it generally take to obtain a default judgment? Well, um, it depends on the type of procedure. Again, if you're going to regular proceedings and you're not having a very difficult case, uh, obtaining a default judgment will be sometimes uh, three months. Now, if you're going to alternative proceedings, uh, I would say that it's uh, almost always 90 days or even more, because uh, these proceedings are limited by law, and sometimes with uh, the process of service of documents, it might push this uh, term a bit above 90 days. And that is it. Thank you, Alex. We actually have several more questions in the list, in the queue. Uh, I'm going to have to wrap it up here, and what I'll do is send those questions on to you, and then you can respond to each uh, individual uh, as soon as you can. Before we end today's session, a couple of quick items. First, please feel free to join the European Legal, Credit, and Debt Collection Forum Discussion Group on LinkedIn, which now has about 1,200 members. We have many credit and collection risk professionals, and you will find our discussions and comments to be quite informative and valuable. Again, the name of the group is the European Legal, Credit, and Debt Collection Forum. I would also like to mention that the Behrens website is behrensgroup.com. That's B-I-E-R-E-N-S group.com. As part of our webinar series, about once a quarter, we'll be profiling the credit and collection situation in another European country that we believe will add value to your international sales and global credit risk management needs. You'll be hearing from us again in a couple of months about our next webinar, which is planned for the end of April. Finally, you'll be receiving a thank you note from us that will contain all of the contact information of our presenter, Mr. Buzumet, for your reference. By all means, please feel free to contact him regarding any questions, comments, or needs that you may have. Alex, thank you so much again for a very informative presentation. And to everyone from around the globe, we've had uh, quite a large attendance again today. Thanks so much for being here, for joining us, and I'll now be ending the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>